Let's take our course books and turn to page number nine. And this is song number two in the song section. How great thou art, O Lord most high, thou holy God and Savior. Thy power and might are more than tongue can tell. But greater far the love that brought salvation And saved the lost from sin and death and hell. O God of love, O God of Calvary, How great thou art, how great thou art, in all the world there is no one like thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Once far from God, an alien and a stranger, of hope bereft, a sinner lost and lone. But Jesus came to rescue from the danger, to give us life, he sacrificed his own. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great thou art, how great thou art, in all the world there is no one like thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, in mercy rich, in love and grace abounding. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, Thine only Son for us was freely given. How great Thou art, in Thee our life begins. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great thou art, how great thou art. In all the world there is no one like thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Let's flip over a page, page 10, and let's sing this song here, The Christ of the Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so i'll cherish the christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home i will cling to the christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God, left his glory above to bear sin on dark calvary so i'll cherish the christ of the cross 
Till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross Till his trophies at last he brings home I will cling to the Christ of the cross And I'll praise him in glory that day to the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true, his shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me some day, for by his grace I am saved and his glory forever i'll share so i'll cherish the christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home i will cling to the christ of the cross and I'll praise him in the glory that day. Bob is coming to read for us. Psalm 74, a masculine of Asaph. O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. This Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. Lift up thy feet into the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their incense for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire unto thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. Thou driest up mighty rivers. The day is thine. The night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove 
unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget it not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of habitations of cruelty. O let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and the needy praise thy name. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies. The tumult of those that rise up against thee increases continually. We pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the shepherd. We are thy sheep. You direct everything every day, dear Lord. All is in thy hands. Creation is made by thee. Be with Ken as he brings forth this message, glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sitting at the right hand of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I love that in verse 22. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. A lot of people think that God needs us to plead his cause, but he has pled his own cause particularly with regard to salvation and sending his son in the world to pay the sin debt for his people. What a glorious God we serve. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we're going to sing this hymn, Our Savior, to praise, and we'll sing it to the tune of, Oh, Worship the King. Oh, what shall we do, our Savior to praise? So faithful and true, abounding in grace. So strong to deliver, so good to redeem. The weakest believers who rest upon him. How happy the man whose heart is set free, the people who can be joyful in thee. Their joy is to walk in the light of his face and sweetly to rest in his comfort and grace. Their daily delight shall be in his name. They shall by grace, grace, his righteousness claim. This righteousness wearing and cleansed by his blood, bold shall they appear in the presence of God. Our Savior alone, the Lord let us bless, who reigns on his throne, the Prince of all peace, who evermore saved us by shedding his blood. All hail, blessed Savior, our Lord and our God. Robert is going to come and read for us. Good morning. John chapter 5, the reading of the Lord's word. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesma, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, 
It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterwards Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worked hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For, for the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which is he witness of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was, he was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works of which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness to me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they that which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not love, not the love of God in you. And I am come into my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in, he, in whom you trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writing, how shall ye believe my words? Let's pray. Father God, we, we come before you now and we thank you and we praise you. Like the infinite man, we have no ability to take up our bed and walk. We came into this world spiritually dead. Christ can only make us whole. Lord, we look to you. You are our rest. Let us praise you and thank you for your grace and mercy. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. That's one of those chapters that if you had no other portion of Scripture than that one, 
that you could take out and read every day, you would say amen, thank the Lord for who Christ is and the revelation of himself. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 224. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving grace to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. David's coming to read for us. John chapter 20 verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, 
for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Father, we thank thankful we can gather in your name and read your word. Many seek a Christ, but only his sheep recognize the Christ of the scriptures, and only his chosen can call him master. Be with Ken as he preaches your gospel. Amen. Well, I've entitled this message, Seeing and Believing. Here, our Lord was pleased to reveal himself unto Mary Magdalene, the one that he had, in his ministry, delivered from seven spirits. And she had been following Christ. And yet, we find her here in front of the empty tomb, unable even to remember what the Lord had said, that after three days he would rise again. And we find her weeping because he's not there, thinking that somehow she would take the body and go bury it. And you say, well, she's acting an awful lot like an unbeliever. Didn't she hear the word that he said? Well, let's just point the finger inward. How many times we have read the word, we've heard what Christ has said, even something as simple as, I am with you till the end of the world. And the first time a trial comes, a storm in your life, some bad news, what do you do? Run around like an unbeliever in a panic. You're in such a state of mind you can't even believe. Nor would you unless the Lord was pleased to come and reveal himself again unto you. What I find here in Mary Magdalene is something that as a believer I've experienced all through the years. Because some will say, well, look how long you've been preaching this gospel. Surely you don't doubt. Surely you don't have dark days. Well, I'm here to tell you I do. And every time I need the Lord again to come and reveal himself unto me. And just like he said to Mary, all he said, all he did, he, she thought he was a gardener. She'd walked with him all those days before, sat under his teaching, but couldn't perceive him until what? He said to her, Mary. And just how he said the word, Mary. She said, Rabboni. She recognized his voice. Here's an example of how the Lord never leaves us alone, never leaves us to ourselves, and thankfully he doesn't. And if someone says, well, I've always believed, well, it's not a one-time thing. This matter of seeing and believing. How we need a new and a fresh every time, a revelation of Christ. That's why we study his word. That's why we go through it that we might hear his voice and hear him speak peace to the hearts of those that he came to save and did save. I love the example here that it's Mary of Magdalene, a woman that wasn't known for anything but being one that was delivered from seven demons, seven devils. But I think about the Rahabs of scripture what was she called? The harlot. And I think about other women down through the scriptures that God has been pleased to call out to himself. Think of Sarah, Abraham's wife, and others that we could note. Esther, particularly in the Old Testament, and then going through the New Testament. There were a number of women that the Lord called to himself that followed him and ministered unto him throughout his lifetime. That the world would look upon and think, well, they're, they're of no value. Well, they were to the Lord. And that's why he came and paid their sin debt. A lot of times, you want to go all the way back to the very first woman, Eve. People say, what about Eve? Well, her name means to be the mother of life. From her would come 
all the rest of the descendants through Adam. And yet it was just as much for her as it was for Adam that God took off the fig leaves in the garden and slew those innocent animals and clothed, what, both of them. And through them would have taught Abel. That's how Abel learned that it was through a blood sacrifice that he would uh, save his people, pointing to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I entitled this Seeing and Believing, it is an ongoing work of grace that we all need, just like with Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, to not only see Christ and having seen him say, well, no, then I've got it. No, to continue to see him. And through seeing, continue to believe on him. Peter wrote about to whom coming. I hear about people talking about, well, I was at an early age, I came to Jesus. And so I know I'm sure of heaven as my own name. My question is, would be to, to which Jesus did you come and are you coming to him now? Because every time we hear his word, our hearts need to be drawn to him. It's not a physical coming but in our hearts to be drawn to him. Such is our need. Over in John chapter 6 and verse 40, before we get into this passage, John 6 and verse 40, I want you to see this connection between seeing and believing. A lot of people running around trying to figure out the time that they believed. Well, guess what? If you're not believing now, then you never did. If you're not seeing now, you never did see. What we need to be concerned about is the moment. By his grace, am I now seeing him? Am I now believing him? And if I am, if he's been gracious to show me who he is, then I'll continue to believe. It's him keeping me in that faith. But here in John chapter 6 and verse 40, the connection of these words is vital. What comes first? Notice Christ said, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which what? Seeth the Son, and what? Believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What is interesting about the tense of those two Greek words, seeth and believeth, is that it is in the present active. So it means it's always present. So which seeth continues to see the sun and it's active. It's an active looking to Christ and believing, notice, on him, being completely cast upon him. There's never a time when, when we don't see our need to be cast upon him. And such is the work of grace. So coming back here to John chapter 20, we find here Mary Magdalene again in front of the empty tomb. Now she had already been there. Remember we saw that in verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And then it says, she ran and cometh to Simon Peter, to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and the other disciple and came to the, the sepulcher. So she had gone and announced the empty tomb to Peter and John. And then, after they had come and observed and left, it says then, because it says in verse 10 of John 20, we saw last time, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Not sure what they were pondering or thinking of at that particular time, but Mary was brought again. Who drew her there? That was the Lord. This simple woman, a woman of no reputation or renown that many would not even consider, and yet here, the Lord, by his spirit, has been pleased to put her in the spotlight. I believe as an example of his elect, of his church. The church is 
referred to as a woman, the bride of Christ, for whom the bridegroom came into this world. And so when it says there that first she came early when it was yet dark, this would have been on the first day of the week, the day following the Sabbath. Christ had been three days and three nights in the tomb and was raised at the end of the Sabbath. I believe he was already raised when she came. That's obvious because the tomb was empty. And it's a picture of when all was finished and done. We have here then what? The son of righteousness who had already risen. Now coming forth and manifesting himself unto those of his own. Those that he came to save. There are many different appearances that our Lord made unto his followers, unto those for whom he came to save. In fact, I noted 14. That would be a message in and of itself. 14 different times where the Lord, as the risen Savior, went and revealed himself unto individuals. He didn't go and reveal himself unto the world. You stop and think, Pilate was still there. Herod was still there. All these that had crucified him, those Pharisees were still there. And yet to none of them did he reveal himself. But you stop and think about a lowly Mary of Magdalene, who was the very first one that he revealed himself to, and she was what? Alone. When the Lord is pleased to reveal himself, he will often separate out each one and reveal himself unto them. In fact, the second time that he revealed himself wasn't even to Simon Peter yet and John who had come. He found certain women again that were returning to the sepulcher along besides Mary of Magdalene that came back. These that were with her initially and uh, he revealed himself unto them. We see that in Matthew 28. But what I want us to consider then here is what it was for Christ to reveal himself unto Mary of Magdalene. And if any one of us are the Lord's, we can identify. Because how he's been pleased to deal with his own in grace down through time is exactly how he continues to deal with his own in grace through time. But here we find a situation with Mary Magdalene outside the sepulcher. And what is she doing in verse 11? Weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. The Lord is often going to bring his own through a time of weeping, a time of humiliation. I know people like to think, and this is the popular message, that if you come to Jesus, all will be well. Well, I guess what? Our lives are going to be full of such times of weeping and sorrow. But what is the weeping and sorrow over is that she could not find Christ. Would that our own souls be so moved that in times where we don't sense or feel his presence, and I emphasize sense or feel because he's never absent. Even here, our Lord had his eyes on her long before she realized it was him, the resurrected Lord. And that's a comfort to me. Even on a cloudy day when I can't see the sun, does that mean the sun's not shining? It's shining. It's just that God has been pleased for a time to put clouds there and block out the sun. And we know how it is when it gets gloomy and uh, sunny and dark, we get gloomy. It depresses because we don't see the sun. But would that would be the case even spiritually as when we live out our lives that in the silence many times where the Lord has put us separated out all alone 
that we don't sense his presence, oh, how that will cause us to weep and uh, to desire to find him. Why? Because our hearts, just like Mary Magdalene, the Lord delivered her from these seven devils and in place of the seven devils revealed himself in her heart. He had captured her heart. He's the strong man, just like any one of us that has entered in and, and chased out the, the darkness and the, the power of Satan that held us and has now taken our hearts captive. So why wouldn't our thoughts be caught up with him? Why would we not desire to see him and uh, that he be with us? But here again, we see how our Lord is faithful and that he does not abandon any of his own. And as much as the emphasis here is on Mary, I would have us consider that it's more on the victorious Savior who has come now to her and not left her in this sorrow, but is going to reveal himself again unto her, even though here she stood for a time weeping. And here again it shows us even our need, as we identify with Mary as a type of his elect or his church, how we need the Spirit to come and reveal Christ again and strengthen our faith. Yes, the Lord gives faith to his own, but that faith is only as strong as what the Spirit of God is pleased to strengthen it. Because in this flesh, we're going to find out pretty quickly, we don't put any confidence in anything in here. Any graces, any faith, any experience, because it's like a vapor. All the Lord has to do is withdraw himself for a minute and it'll all wither. Like we're all like grass. It'll wither and dry up. Maybe a beautiful flower today, but tomorrow, what happened to my flower? If we're looking inside, it's going to wither. No, our eyes need to be outside. They need to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we see the faithfulness of Christ and not leaving any of his own. He comes to her. Without him coming and revealing himself again to her, she would have, she would have been in desperate straits and continued to, to do nothing but weep. But think about... She couldn't be comforted until it was the Lord who pleased, was pleased to reveal himself. Because initially, she saw the angels. And it says there in verse 12, seeth two angels. A couple of the accounts mention one, but there were at least two. And it says they were sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. So even there, she would have again seen where, as we saw last time, the linens were folded and put away. It shows a particular order, the napkin that was for the head and the, the linen clothes that had wrapped Christ's body. It's like Christ rose and not even those things deterred him. He made his bed before he left. <laughs> but he had been there. But he wasn't to stay there. But here's the point that I want us to see. That not even the words of the angels brought her comfort. A lot of people are fascinated with the angels. But even here when the two angels, verse 13, said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She wasn't even encouraged by the fact that they were angels. Maybe didn't even perceive that they were. Many times the angels appeared just as men. And she said unto them, Because they have taken my, away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. You see, this is what is of significance to any that the Lord has bought and taught. That are his. Where have they laid him? Where is Christ? 
I know there were many times where over the years we could sit and listen to a message from the Bible and walk out and say, oh, that was a good message. Motivational, fires me up. But the question is, where's Christ? That's a good question to ask our acquaintances when they go to their places of worship and they come away and think, oh, we heard a good message today. Well, what, what did they say of Christ? Oh, well, th this wasn't particularly about Christ. This had to do with our witness and da-da-da-da. Well, that's not a good message. You can see here that Mary of Magdalene represents one for whom Christ came paid her sin debt and drew her to himself. But now that she could not see him, wasn't that he wasn't there. He was near, he was there, but she could not see him. She continued to weep and nothing could be of comfort to her. I dare say as we read the word that my prayer is that the Lord give us this same thought Give me Christ or I die. We cannot look for Christ too much. We cannot be too obsessed with where he is. And I dare say that there are many preachers that have taken the Lord and we know not where they have laid him. A lot of preachers, they, they don't, their goal is not to seek Christ here in the scriptures. And in listening to them, many times that is what thought comes to my mind. They've taken away the Lord. They've taken him completely out of the scriptures. And they've laid him, we know not where. But we're not going to rest until he's pleased to come again unto us and reveal himself unto us. Oh, that we would say as the psalmist there in Psalm 123, one, unto thee I lift up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. We know that's where Christ is right now. And the scripture says, set your affection, not affections, but affection on things above where Christ is seated. Yeah, here on earth, we're going to go through trials and difficulties, just as like we sang, I know whom I have believed, I know not whether... I'll walk with him through the veil or be caught up with him when he comes again. But I know whom I have believed. That's the seeking and believing that we cannot rest until he's pleased to once again come unto us and lift us up. And so even here, seeing these two angels, that was no comfort to her nor can any be for us. We're not to be focused on angels. Yes, the Lord does send his angels, his ministering spirits unto those that are heirs of salvation, but that's not our affection. That's not where our hearts look. That's not our curiosity or speculation. Just like any subject, you can use the Bible as a topical index. And well, This week we're going to study about angels and next week we're going to study about faith and next week we're going to look about what it is to love all these different topics that people use the bible to address and yet if christ is not preached if christ is not exalted then it's just like an empty tomb he's not here he's not there oh that we would have christ and so, again, even in her sorrow, and this is where I was saying how we need a fresh view of Christ every time, even to this point, you know, the angels did not even reprove her here in verse 13 when she said to, the, to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Angels never act on their own. They never speak but what God has commanded them to speak. And you might wonder, well, why didn't the angels at this point correct her and say to her, oh, well, you didn't hear what Christ had said, that he would rise again the third day? 
Why were they even here? Even though Christ was on the earth, he as God had sent them. And so they were as messengers at attention only to say what the Lord directed them to say, knowing full well that in his time he would come and he would speak that word of comfort unto her. And you can understand then why her desire is to see him again. And such is the desire that the Lord gives to any of his own. Now verse 14, when she had thus said, she turned herself back. And here it is, saw Jesus standing. She saw him, but she didn't see him. And here, again, is a picture of conversion. A lot of people talk about conversion like it's a one time. I was converted back. Well, unless we're converted again, because our hearts are such that we need this ongoing work of conversion. Conversion just means turning 180 degrees. And I see that while she had thus said, she turned herself back. That's what we see her doing, turning back and turning toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But how we need that all the time, because we're so focused on what's in front of us and what we're going through and what we're experiencing, that unless the Lord be pleased to come again and turn us back to himself. You see, we live and move and have our being in him. So even when it says she turned herself back, she would not have turned back had the Lord himself not turned her back. And again, her eyes being clouded, she did not even hear. She, she saw Jesus standing. I liken this as so many times. We can read the word and see, oh yeah, that has to do with the Lord Jesus. In that scripture, we see we understand the, the truth, we understand the fact, but still we don't fully see him as he is in all his glory. And how we need again his spirit to turn our hearts and to teach us once again. I go through this every time that I prepare to preach a message. There's nothing perfunctory about preparing for a message. I need, by God's grace, first of all, to be taught of Christ and to see Christ again anew and afresh so that when I stand here and preach for you, I am preaching for you what the Lord has been pleased to bless in my heart. And then in my prayer is that as each of you, he turns again to himself, that you be brought to see him fully as that song that hymn we sing turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful faith and the things that earth occupies us with grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and so that's what we see here it's the lord turning her back and here now comes the comfort here now comes where the weeping turns to joy because as, first of all, she turned and knew him not. But when she heard his voice, and I'm not talking about us hearing an audible voice, but here it was, when he spoke unto her. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Even there in his speaking, she still did not recognize his voice. And her thoughts were such, and her heart so heavy, that she continued to be blinded. It's like those on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection when the Lord appeared unto them, and he asked them what they were talking about, and they were surprised. You've been in Jerusalem, you haven't heard? The one who he had hoped had been the Redeemer? You can just imagine our Lord walking along, listening to them, talking about him in the third person, not knowing it was him. But why didn't they know him? Well, that says there in Luke 24, their eyes were holding. 
Even the Lord told his disciples, said, there are many things I have to say unto you, you cannot bear them right now. This whole notion that somehow once Christ is revealed in the heart, we've got all knowledge now. Well, we know everything. I know there's some people that act like it, but they need to be brought down a notch. No, we need to be more like Mary of Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, seeing our need and weeping until such time as he's pleased to reveal himself unto her. Even though she'd walked with Christ, she heard his voice, but she didn't hear it until such time as he said unto her there in verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. There's that call, just like when he brought Lazarus again from the grave. Lazarus, come forth. He calls each of his own by name. He knows them, who they are. And when he addressed her by name, see, initially he called her woman. That's a general term. That wasn't a derogatory term. But really addressing her as somebody that is his by creation, and, he, and she was, and his by his sovereign providence, even her name would not have been her name had it not been ordained by God himself. But when he spoke to her as Mary, now this is the Redeemer addressing one of his own individually, specifically, and uh, that's what the scripture says. He knows his sheep. Christ said that in John 10 and verse 3. He calleth his own sheep out by name. Because their names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. And it was for them that he came. And he laid down his life. And that's when you read there that she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Oh, to see Christ in all his glory, to hear his voice and to know who he is and to know that all that we are and have is because of him and who he is. That's where the cup begins to overflow. My cup overfloweth and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Initially, she had turned away from him because it says there, that she turned back to him again. And uh, such would be our case. How quickly, that's what sheep do, don't they? They wander. How quickly we would turn, but how needful it is for us to hear the shepherd's voice again, calling us again to himself. Not scolding us, but tenderly drawing us to himself. Now when he says there in verse 17, touch me not, that's not like, uh oh you can't touch me. She was literally grabbing him and hanging on to him, hugging him. <laughs> That's what you do when the Lord draws you. You just hug up to him. But he said to her, what he was saying is, stop touching me. Stop holding me, was what he was saying. This is not the end. I've come, I've revealed myself unto you. But as he says, I'm not yet ascended to my father. His work to be complete was that he should again ascend back to his father and be seated on that throne. And yes, take with him everyone for whom he paid the sin debt. Mary Magdalene included. But she was not to be holding on to him like, okay, this is it. Now we're going to spend the rest of our time with him. No, it was purpose that he should come and accomplish his work and he did it and then send back up to the father where he ever lives to intercede on behalf of those for whom he paid the debt and will come again in his time. What was it that he gave her to do then? Go and testify of what you've seen and heard. And that's why the Lord has us here. So long as he has us on this earth, like Mary Magdalene, it says she came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. That wasn't just physically, but she had seen him even spiritually, her eyes being open, and that he had spoken these things unto her. That's how any of us 
can see the Lord, only that he has been pleased to take his word and speak it to our hearts. I can't do it. But if the Lord's pleased to take even a simple word like this and show us Christ, I'll tell you what, we'll run to him and we'll embrace him for who he is. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 226. I am not skilled to understand what God hath willed, what God hath planned. I only know at his right hand is one who is my Savior. I take him at his word indeed. Christ died for sinners, this I read. For in my heart I find a need of him to be my Savior. That he should leave his place on high and come for sinful men to die. And now did strange, so once did I, before I knew my Savior. And oh, that he fulfilled may see the travail of his soul in me. And with his work contented be as I with my dear Savior. Yea, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from this spring, that he who lives to be my king once died to be my Savior. All right, we will be dismissed and look forward to our next time, Lord willing.